Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to welcome today's colloquium speaker, Professor Maxim Sukarev from ASU, you know that other Arizona University that we don't talk about very much. Um, Maxim uh, got his PhD in general, at the General Physics Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences in, year, in 2000. Um, he then went on for a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at, at the CNRS Laboratory for Molecular Photo Photophysics at the University of Paris South in Sacré, France, or Say France, I should say, sorry. Um, and then he did a postdoc at Northwestern University, and he's been at uh, ASU since 2008, and he's currently an associate professor of physics and applied sciences and mathematics at, the, uh, at ASU. Um, I met Maxim actually um, through, uh, we we're jointly funded by R.J. Nachman at AFOSR, so we meet every year in Washington, D.C., and um, he's been doing some very interesting research, which has actually quite a significant overlap with, with some of our interests. So I'm really pleased he could make it, and um, look forward to hearing his talk on Exodon Plasmon Nanosystems, Modeling, Understanding, and Predicting New Phenomena. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you guys for coming. I will use my lecture voice. So um, um, before I forget, I have to say a lot of things. And the first thanks is obviously to our funding source. This is Air Force and the Binational Science Foundation that allows us to fund undergraduate and graduate students during summertime. <clears throat> Um, I'm really lucky being theoretician to collaborate with experimental guys. Uh, outstanding uh, experimentalist Adi Solomon. She used to work with Tom Ebison when she was a postdoc there. So now she's a faculty at Bar Ilan University in Israel. I think she has the most advanced non-fabrication lab in Israel slash uh, Europe. That's exactly what she said to me, so I believe her. Uh, Rino Vali, he's at the uh, CNRS at the University of Bordeaux. So I'll talk a little bit about his work. So he was able to um, um, experimentally validate one of the phenomena we predicted. And it was not easy for us. It's just press the button, press any key science. You press the button, you get a phenomena, and you publish a paper. In his case, it's a bit different. You have to actually build the system and observe the phenomena. So he's an outstanding uh, experimentalist. And we closely collaborate with the Air Force lab with Ruth Pachter at the um, um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, Abraham Nitsan, a big collaborator of ours, now he used to be at um, Tel Aviv University, and now he's at the University of Pennsylvania. And Eric Sharon and uh, Joseph Botnik also at UPAP. So this is my ambitious outline. I don't think I'll be able to cover everything I really want to, but it's always good to have more slides than uh, always can stop depending on how many of you fall asleep. So we'll start with a simple discussion of a modeling concept. We'll talk about what I'm referring to as exciton plasmon. In reality, it sounds really fancy, but if you listen and bear with me, it turns out to be really simple. Um, we'll talk more about linear optics. I'll describe the, the phenomenon of so-called dipole-induced dipole transparency. And the most important part is this collective optical response at high molecular concentrations. This is the phenomenon we predicted should be existing. And that's what Renault saw in his recent experiments in 2017. So, and then a quick um, overlook of what we need to do in order to model more realistic systems. So we're going beyond a simple two-level model to add more degrees of freedom and how this affects all the phenomena we will talk about. And if time allows, this is the most interesting part. It's where my research interests mainly in. Uh, this is nonlinear optics and especially high harmonic generation at the plasmonic interfaces with molecules and whatnot. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing first, before we begin discussing what um, models we're using, let's first define what systems we're talking about. So the first part is to introduce the near fields of what we call plasmons, and when I'm referring to the word plasmon, my plasmon is electromagnetic uh, mode associated with the actual plasmon oscillation. So this is my plasmon, and every time I say that word, I'm referring to electromagnetic mode, the, the particular field. The first example is uh, localized surface plasmon. When you look at the scattering cross-section of, let's say, silver nanoparticle uh, with a diameter of 50 nanometers, you have uh, need resonance around 375. 
So what happens at the near field, if you look at the dynamics of the electromagnetic radiation, um, here is the uh, simulations when you have a plane wave coming from left to the right and is vertically polarized, you exciting the system at the resonant wavelength, and what you see is the buildup of the energy on the surface. And one more thing you also, of course, see is uh, uh, part of the energy comes through because the size of the particle is comparable to its skin layer. Okay, that's why it's slightly transparent. But most important, take a look at these fields. Um, uh, building up on the surface of the particle. So this is this localized surface plasma mode of interest. And our next step is to be able to put molecules in and to use these fields as detectors or crafting um, materials that will be able to control molecules and whatnot. So this is the first one. The second one is a bit more involved, obviously. So the previous example is well known. This one is a bit more involved when you are talking about, let's say, L-shaped nanoparticle. So these are two papers that um, we published. The first one is a theory, and the second one with experiment. So if you look at the L-shaped nanoparticle, you have two um, axes of symmetry. And depending on the external excitation polarization, you can excite different bands. In this case, what we call red band. So if your polarization is this way, or blue band this way. Or if you're somewhere in between of those two, you see two bands at the same time. So if you do the white light spectroscopy and you see the transmission or reflection, you'll see these type of resonances. So how, how do near field look like for these particular modes? As the first example with this blue mode. So uh, I'm about 10 nanometers above the surface of L-shaped particle. And I'm shining the light at about 2.5 electron volts. So you see these hot spots, and again, you imagine that uh, this is not just in vacuum, then I want to place molecules in, how different molecules will react to these type of things, and so on. Uh, all you got to do is just to flip the uh, polarization and change the wavelength a little bit, right? And this is the red mode. Same particle, but of course, the other portion of this is excited because of the symmetry, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at the local field of the red mode, for example, calculate um, um, x component of electric field, y component of electric field, and out of the plane, easy component, they look really neat. And imagine, again, have molecules that are reacting on one side of this nanoparticle one way and the other side the other way, depending on their orientation and whatnot. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about periodic systems, uh, not because uh, they are so awesome is just because they're easy to simulate. And it turns out some of them are relatively easy to make in experiments. So this is one of the examples of a periodic array of slits, which is a two-dimensional example, because if your wires are long enough compared to the, way, uh, to the um, period, you can drop all derivatives relative to this coordinate, and you end up with a 2D, approximately 2D electromagnetic problem, right? So this type of structure has several resonances, and this is one of them. This is, again, surface plasma mode associated with interactional wires one with another. And if I am to look at the fields um, related to this particular resonance over here, so these fields look something like that. So I have external light coming from the top. It is horizontally polarized. And I'm shining the light, and you see you building up uh, the modes on top and the bottom. And most importantly, you have some hot spots right inside the slits as well. Okay, so uh, this example. And then finally, so we uh, Adi uh, really likes to work with periodic array of holes because she's perfected uh, nanofabrication of those. She's doing various types of geometries varying from um, circular guys, all the squares, triangles, or whatever size you want, and so on. So uh, this is one of the examples where we run simulations compared with experiment. And this is the transmission as a function of the incoming frequency uh, for periodic array of holes. And you see these two peaks over here. This is actually hybridiz hybridized mode living on top and on the bottom of the thin uh, metal because of the thickness. If you increase the thickness, this becomes a single resonance. Okay, so these are hybrid modes. Uh, and if I am to place the detector near the output side, for instance, or input side, this one was the output side, and look what the fields look like, for one of these modes, this should resemble something of a dipole, actually like a big dipole. So this is the hole, 
and you see the intensity coming out. By the way, all these graphs, what you're looking at are logarithmic scale graphs. So meaning that um, the red spot would correspond to about three, four orders of magnitude enhancement compared to the incident intensity, something like that, and so on. <clears throat> so these are the fields we want to play with. And now the next step is to place the molecules in and try to simulate that. Uh, so imagine that we're talking about periodic array of holes. Depending on the angle of incidence, you can adjust your in-plane k vector such that the plasmal mode resides in one of the uh, wavelengths of interest. By tuning this or changing the periodicity in your computer program, you can move around these peaks back and forth, right? So now, uh, ID, in addition to the fact of being a really good experimentalist, she's a great chemist. So she can make this type of J-aggregates with a desired peak somewhere in the visible part of the spectrum. So if you take this rice, well, quote unquote rice, these J aggregates placed on top of this periodic array of holes, she usually places one two nanometer thin on, on the spacer because of some chemistry and interaction with metal. And what you see is that if this absorbance peak for the J aggregate is on top of a um, one of the plasmon modes, plasmon mode speed splits in two. This is the example of a coupled, strongly coupled oscillators. So you have um, uh, hybridized mode, modes again. This is um, upper and lower polaritons. And these are the modes that are um, having properties of both plasmons and molecules. Um, uh, molecules. But you don't really need a sophisticated theory to explain that. All you have to do is a diagonalize two by two matrix, right? Uh, diagonals are just your energies of plasma and molecules, and off diagonal is a coupling. And then you plot this coupling as a function of, let's say, a k vector, and then you have your uh, perfect avoided crossing picture, and so on. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to um, uh, jump a little bit further and look whether there are any collective effects if the density of molecules is really high. So what happens, obviously, um, we would anticipate that might be some sort of a super radiant mode, it's classical super radiant mode, something like that. So that was our goal initially uh, several years ago. <coughs> so we'll come back to this. So here's the model. Uh, so we solve Maxwell's equations and Maxwell's equations we trust. Uh, then the molecular part is handled by either uh, block equations, Louisville von Neumann equation, or later on I'll show you the Schrodinger equation when we talk about diatomic molecules with all degrees of freedom taken into account. But overall, this is a quantum part that needs um, uh, to calculate the average dipole moment at the given point in space. Then I multiply that by the number density of molecules, assuming that that does not depend on time. And then I have a microscopic polarization. Then I take the time derivative and plug it back into Ampere law, and that's it. Um, one careful thing you should think about before implementing that in the computer is the following fact. So take a look at this very simple picture. Blue color corresponds to the vertical polarization, and if you don't have any structure, everything will be blue as long as you have a plane wave coming in. So blue, dark, blue, dark. Now I place um, some sort of a metal or perfect electric conductor with some apertures. Because of sharp corners, because of different angles of diffraction, I have, obviously, generation of um, horizontal component, the red color. So, all right. Now, if you look closely at these regions, you have both blue and red, which means that the local molecule that sits exactly over there feels both EX and Y components, and I need to be able to connect this laboratory system of frame EX, the Y components into molecular part and simulate that. So we, this means in 3D, uh, two-level emitter is not a two-level, obviously. It has to be uh, like PX, PY, PZ orbital, something like that. If you go into more sophisticated examples, such as a stimulated uh, adiabatic Raman passage, for instance, then you took different M states and F states and, and mixed them up, and it turns out to be a hassle, but it, it, it looks pretty, pretty complicated if you are to take into account these different polarizations and so on. So we do that. That's what I'm saying. All right, once we do that, this is the um, sort of uh, holy grail of everything that we have at the moment. So we have plasmon sustaining material. It doesn't have to be a plasmon one, as long as you have a dispersion, right? So you have a Faraday law of induction and Ampere law. And then 
if you want to simulate dispersion in metal, you can use a simple Drude model, or you can use Lorentz model, or you can combine those and treat these guys as just phenomenological model with feeding parameters that will give you given epsilon from experiment, right? A linear part. Uh, so then we have a Maxwell block equations on each grid point where molecules are. And once we simulate all of that, we want to be in a continuous state, which means that our answer should not depend on the discretization delta x, delta y, delta z. So we'll make sure of that, obviously. Um, so the summary is, so every grid point occupied by quantum systems is associated with the polarization density driven by local field, number one. Uh, the total density matrix in this approach is a product of density matrices, which means that it's a mean field approximation. So all these guys do interact with one another via classical electromagnetic radiation. So the collective effects as in entanglement is not included, okay? Uh, that would be awesome to include and we're working on that and that's not easy obviously. Uh, <clears throat> now, all grid point to grid point interactions are all automatically included as long as you run the simulations self-consistently. So you have all the interactions everywhere, even though they are small, they're still taking into account. So the linear and nonlinear optics is present as long as you treat molecules correctly. So you can put two level systems and then you can have um, um, harmonic generation, uh, like third, fifth, and so on harmonic generation. And if you complicate your molecular system, you'll have whatever um, uh, uh, nonlinear phenomena you can expect. Now, so currently uh, we're expanding that to include the nonlinear Drude model uh, to accommodate nonlinear response of metals as well. If time allows, I'll show you some um, preliminary results that we currently have. So our goal, uh, this has been done, and Jerry was doing that for quite some time, but our goal is to combine all of that together. So to see the nonlinear response from the several nonlinear systems combined together. Okay. All right, so everybody knows that, but I thought I would, I would show it because uh, I recently was able to write the three-dimensional uh, discretization things, my friend, very much for your tutorial. So, uh, so we use a finite difference time domain codes and we write our own codes and we parallelize them. This is the lazy man approach that we used before. And now we um, migrated all the way to discretization based on 3D domain um, decomposition. Now it works perfectly because we have access to uh, Department of Defense, uh, Department of Defense uh, clusters where you can use tens of thousands of processors and so on. I never used that much, but about 3,000 is more than enough for our types of systems. So instead of waiting two days, we can wait 30 minutes or 40 minutes. All right, thank you very much. So <clears throat> uh, we went slightly more into that type of things, and then we're dealing with more complex molecules where, let's say I have many degrees of freedom, then a simulation of a single propagation of a wave function takes some time. So if I have a processors that are dealing with molecules here, and processors are dealing with metal here, these guys will take more time to simulate. So what we do, we parallelize FDTD, and once we approach where the molecules are, we reparallelize them again, propagate to one time step, and put everything back, and so on. So this ginormously increases the uh, efficiency, but it's a hell of a programming exercise. So anyway, but uh, it's usually worth it very much. So this is our local cluster where we run some small things, and this is the access we currently have through Air Force Grant on the Thunder, and now they have the new one building in the uh, Wright-Peterson base. <clears throat> All right, so enough with this. Let's take a look at the actual physics. Um, so let's talk about very simple thing. One-dimensional uh, slab of a bunch of two-level systems interacting. So is there anything interesting we can learn from that? Uh, well. You'd be surprised how many interesting things you can learn from very simple system thought that, you know, people already discovered a lot of that many years ago. So you take a look at the slab on the, uh, the uh, thickness on the order of half a wavelength or so. And this other thing is a bunch of two level systems combined. They all identically all interact and I solve Maxwell block equations and I look at the linear transmission. How much energy is coming through, how many energy is reflected back as uh, at the small intensity. Okay, so what you expect to see is the following. If you look at the reflection as a function of the frequency at different densities, 
Uh, these are scaling parameters, but so this is the density and this is the frequency. At the very low density, you have a resonance precisely where two level systems are scattering and absorbing, obviously. You keep on cranking up the density without changing anything else. The absorption increases, so reflection becomes higher more and more and more. And eventually what happens is that you have some sort of a tra um, uh, reflection window, which is almost 100% reflective, and then you have these tiny small resonances, nothing but the Fabry Pierre resonances, they're exactly Fabry Pierre ones. So if you are to write down the equations, you're going to get exactly this shape. Okay? So nothing fancy. Uh, <clears throat> to explain why you have this sort of a reflection window, what you got to do is to take a look at the susceptibility. It turns out that because of the high density, it's shifted and your susceptibility real part is negative at this window which means that your diatomic uh, the, your two level systems are um, oscillating out of phase with the incident field pretty much like metal that's why it's reflective right so you're canceling out the propagation and so on uh, and then you can do some analytics and compare that with the simulation so next step what we did was to look at the um, combination of two types of two levels, or two sets of dipoles, for instance, or V type of uh, molecule, right? Well, you have two dipole transitions relatively close such that their um, absorption overlap, right? But they, with different energies. So if we do that, and this is very busy uh, um, slide, but uh, let me walk you through. So this, take a look at blue line. So blue line is what you would expect if you have only one type of dipoles, and this will be the transmission. So if you are 100% reflection, zero transmission, right? Now you turn on additional dipole at the same density and you look what happens. And what happens is this uh, orange line. You see this peak, this transmission window pops up. Now the higher the density, the more uh, pronounced this transmission window is. It reaches almost 80, 90% depending on parameters. And so you have some sort of a transmission window. And what happens is if you are to examine the susceptibility, you have two resonances, and one of them has a really clear funnel profile, which indicates there is an interference going on. So in reality, what happens is that you have two types of dipoles oscillating one in phase, one out of phase, canceling each other. That's why the light comes through without sort of uh, being altered. So that's a transparency window that I'm talking about. So my collaborator uh, in France uh, decided to name that uh, dipole-induced electromagnetic transparency. This is linear effect. It has nothing to do with well-known electromagnetic transparency, which is non-linear one, right? And then uh, the reason he liked that is because if you look at the first letters, it's, it's diet. He liked that. All right. So what, what about this diet thing if you are to place that next to plasmon systems? Is it real one? Is just a simplification of 1D. So if I am to do these simulations and take a look at the transmission for periodic area of holes, placing this slab with the two types of dipoles, I still see that tiny small window. It's not as pronounced as it should be, and, uh, but it could be higher as long as dephasing is lower and a uh, bunch of other things. So you do see this effect, that's what I'm saying. There is one more thing that you notice, this tiny small resonance. This is my second interesting part of the talk. Okay, so diet, we're done with diet one. It's always good to, s to say that you're done with diet. Um, so excitonic cluster. So what, what if we change the geometry? Instead of a 1D slab, let's take a look at the sphere of molecules or circle if you want to. Um, so these are two level systems combined inside uh, the cluster with there no metal yet. Uh, so I'm shining the light, and I'm, again, I'm interested in scattering. And what I expect to see at the low density, I expect to see a small resonance corresponding to the transition for a single dipole, and hence because of other dipoles doing the same thing, right? So if I am to increase the density, will I be able to see some sort of a super radiant mode or not? That was the sort of goal of this research. So we indeed, we see the, uh, this huge resonance sitting in here, and it scales quadratically. Uh, with the number density, indicating that this is indeed some sort of a collective effect, classical type of a collective effect. So this is the super radiant mode that we want to translate back into uh, molecule slash plasmon systems to see if it's possible to observe and what new things we can learn from that. Okay? So that was done quite some time ago, 2011. 
And then ID came around and she said, well, let's take a look at the periodic array of slits. Now you have this code. Let's increase the density and see if there is anything new. All right, so we started with periodic array of slits, put molecules on top. And then at low density, if you are to vary the k vector, right, the angle of incidence or the periodicity, you can see that the plasma one resonance swipes through the energy of the um, uh, absorption for the molecule and you have this avoided crossing picture and then dots are the simulations and the solid lines are two by two matrix diagonalization models. So everything falls perfectly as it should be. So now I'm cranking up the density and what I observe is this weird feature. So in addition to the fact that I have two modes, hybridized modes, right, because this is strong coupling, I have this additional dude that sits right in the middle and is nearly dispersionless. So that's third mode cannot be obviously explained in terms of two by two matrix, right? So that was um, um, uh, <coughs> the outcome of this paper. So uh, we argued that that might be some uh, molecular super radiant mode excited or enhanced by plasmons, and we are actually wrong at that time. But we did publish paper in Fizzer of Letters, so, which is always good, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, so, and then we sort of happily forgot about that, and then we thought that uh, experiments is really hard to do, and then the temperature will destroy all of that, dephasing is huge, and if you increase the dephasing, that mold just literally disappears from the spectrum and so on. And then uh, Renault came around. So he contacted me uh, in 2016, and he said, we have experiments where we do see the third mode, and it is dispersionless, and I came across your paper, and why don't you come to Bodo, and we do some you know, stuff, and then see if your theory predicts what we see in experiment. So his experiment is quite sophisticated, from my theoretical point of view. Uh, so that's how it looks like. So what we have, what he has, is a... Uh, Opal array, so periodic array of uh, self-assembled polystyrene spheres with a particular diameter of 400 something nanometers. Then you put on top a thin layer of um, uh, metal, in this case silver, and then some spacer, and then um, uh, J aggregates. So if you ask me what J aggregates were, I have a tiny small note, uh, some organic crap thing, very long name. So it looks like that over there. That's what Reno told me. So the good news is that um, it, absorption peak lies somewhere where so-called Bragg plasmon of this system is. So there is a coupling, there is a splitting, and then he's able to change the density of molecules. Uh, don't ask me how, that's magic to me in chemistry. So without altering anything else. So I'm going to show you the experimental results. So what he sees is the following. They look at the reflection. So this is the zoom in of the part of the spectrum for the reflection as a function of frequency with no molecules. So this is your plasmon mode, okay? Now you put the molecules in at the low density. So for the transmission, remember you had two peaks. For the reflection, you have two minima, okay? So these are two minima. And you can scale these minima, these are the lower and upper, upper polariton modes and then you recover this type of avoided crossing for low densities, okay? Rabi splitting, low densities, blah, blah, blah. So now he comes with his magic and uh, uh, chemistry and he is able to increase the density to the point where he sees third resonance over here. Then he looks at this third resonance and he looks how this resonance varies with uh, um, angle, uh, I'm sorry, with the, um, ah, this is the wrong way. You can tell I'm a theoretician, right? Okay, so uh, the third mode that he sees is nearly dispersionless, which is a good indication for what we might see uh, theoretically. So, and we jump ahead and start simulating that. The bad news was that we could not simulate exactly the same period, so we had to scale everything down a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so we simulate on uh, this system using polystyrene, glass substrate, and silver in 3D, put the molecules in, but our molecules are not his molecules. Our molecules are simple two levels ones. So we assume that we have enough density, enough higher um, the dipole transition, so we can simulate this absorption peak that I showed you earlier, okay? And see, hoping that this is enough to see that third resonance. 
So what we see in is indeed the third resonant mode. So this is reflection, and this dashed line indicates the transition for the single two-level system. And you better examine transmission because it clearly shows this third resonance. That's, that, that's where he is. Okay? So now we can also look at the um, um, uh, dispersion, and it looks like very similar to uh, what Renault sees, and we have this third mode. Most importantly, what the theory predicts is at low densities, Rabi splitting, i.e. the energy difference between two hybridized moles, should scale as a square root of number of molecules. That's that we know from the theory. And now if we do this type of scaling and calculate that, what happens in our case when the density goes up, dashed line is what theory predicts, and this is what you actually see from numerical experiments. So there is a deviation. Uh, and this, when the deviation occurs, is precisely when the third mode pops up in the spectrum. Okay, so deviation from square root of n. So what the hell is this resonance? So now we, uh, Renault was really consistent in terms of pushing me very hard to explain it all the way down so he can understand it, what he says. So hand-waving model. So I'll try not to lift myself too much when I wave my hands. So take a look at the very simple hematonium that you can build with identical molecules with energies along the diagonal and the single plasmon mode. I assume that all molecules are interacting with plasmon the same way. So this delta is the energy coupling between them, each molecule and plasmon. And constant C is constant everywhere. So this constant C defines the interaction between the molecules. And it's really magical that this particular matrix could be diagonalized analytically for any dimension as long as C is constant. So if I do that, I'm going to get three roots. And once we saw that, that was really cool. So the first two roots should remind you of the square root, should remind you of these upper and lower polaritons, exactly that. And the third one, surprisingly, is n minus 2 degenerate. And it has no plasmon characteristics at all. It's pure molecular line, where your energy molecular transition is shifted by these magical constant C that we're about to find what that C is, okay? So uh, let's see if this uh, s very simple man model predicts what we see in simulations uh, um, uh, qualitatively. So number one, Rabi splitting at high density, at a low densities, it does scale the square root of n, if you do that. It scales differently and deviates from n at high densities, that's exactly what we see. So now the question is, so what is this C? How do we define that? So what we did was the following. We did a bunch of numerical experiments and tried to scale our simulations for different geometries, 2D, 3D, um, and figure out how this constant C would scale if this omega n is what I see in my simulations. And if I place this as energy transition, and how do I have to look at this C, how it scales with the dipole of the molecules, with a bunch of other things. So, so what is constant C? Um, observations from numerical modeling, and we did about five different geometries, uh, completely different ones. So, uh, slits, different types of holes, and I think we also did, uh, um, um, what is it, uh, uh, core shell nanoparticles and so on. So we always see that constant C itself is positive, so this, there is always um, minus in front. Okay, so we always see that the energy of the new mode is always lower than the energy of a single molecule. That's what we always see. Number one, observation number two, for relatively low dipole moments, we do see the scaling nearly perfectly square of a dipole, like near perfect parabola. <clears throat> Another one is nearly perfect scaling with a number of molecules which gives us uh, the ability to say that this is one over cube over distance between molecules, something like that. So if you combine all of this, this will be our high school uh, potential energy of a dipole driven by another dipole, basically, right? So there was one question that one of guys asked, um, Jerry, you were around, um, this guy from Princeton uh, two years ago, and he said, is it the first order? It was a perfect question because we went back and I started increasing density to see what happens. There is, um, there is another peak popping up. If density is too high, another one and another one. And so these are new types of uh, new additional dipole uh, 
modes that are popping up. So this is the first order, okay, of potential energy. All right, so <clears throat> let me show you um, examples of this um, behavior in different uh, systems. So core shell nanoparticle, we have this nice third mode popping up over here. Um, periodic array of V groups um, it was a big deal for um, uh, group Bozhevolny uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. They did a lot of work on V groups. So if you put the molecules inside uh, V groups and see what happens to the reflection, you have that third mode popping up as well, if the density is high enough. Now, periodic area of holes, here is the third mode. And moreover, if you replace two levels with the actual diatomic molecules, including vibrational degrees and rotational degrees of freedom, you have that third mode popping up, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, that concludes the, uh, the hand-waving part. So now, uh, if we want to go beyond the two-level systems, that's what we do. We actually um, um, consider diatomic molecules, and we combine these simulations with uh, uh, molecular raw vibrational wave packet propagation, doing split operator and whatnot for each molecule and so on. The interesting part is that we can actually model, obviously, uh, the, um, uh, so this is the ground state as a function of internuclear separation, and this is the excited state, either a dissociative excited state or another bound state. So bound-bound transitions, so bound continuum transitions. So if we have to replace the uh, two-level systems with these molecules, uh, there is a really cool, uh, um, um, in interesting phenomenon that we see. So one of them is, so here's a uh, my favorite um, um, uh, periodic array of slits, right? And this is the plasmon resonance zoomed in. So if I put only two level systems, I have a small splitting and the hybrid modes and that we talked about. Now I'm looking at the bound-bound transitions where instead of two levels, now I have two actually potential energy surfaces where the wave pack is moving back and forth. And what you see is the splitting still there, but you see this structure. Initially we thought that there's some wrong with the code. It turns out these are the frank quantum transitions from one bound state to another bound state. So. Uh, and if you do the bound continuum transitions, you have this type of energy, and there is a splitting, obviously, as well. So we can examine the dispersion, and we see also at high molecular density is the third mode and a bunch of other things. These types of simulations do take quite some time, obviously. All right, so I'm almost there. Are you up for it, Terry? Sure. <laughs> okay. So this is what uh, we are currently very much interested in and in jumping into nonlinear optics. And I'm going to show you just two examples of that. So uh, uh, one of them is a photon echo spectroscopy. And we were interested in just simulating photon echo on these type of systems and trying to learn, is there anything unique to these exciton plasmon systems uh, from these two uh, uh, the pulse experiment, and can we learn something new from that? And then the next one is the harmonic generation. I'll show you the results that we just recently got. So, so in order to simulate these type of things, we uh, introduce uh, the broadening, obviously. So we have at the singular site many molecules with the different frequencies, the particular distribution, and we solve that on the grid and we put everything in the computer and we're interested in the following pulse sequence. So we come in with pi over two pulse and we um, monitor the free induction decay while the, all these guys are dephasing, so there is no polarization anymore, right? And then we wait long enough such that everything decays and dephases and then we come with a pi pulse, reversing the time, and then a photon echo comes out and our goal is to uh, look at the uh, time of this photon echo and the structure of this photon echo, whether there is any unique thing about the strong coupling in buried inside. That's the, that's the question. We, uh, these are on the order of uh, hundreds of femtoseconds. So uh, it, it takes a long time to simulate these type of things because we want to converge and have enough frequencies, right, to have a free induction decay. So yeah, hundreds of femtoseconds. So overall, this is about two-ish picoseconds on the order of, okay? So uh, we look at the periodic area of slits, put the molecules in and they shine the light. And uh, before we proceed to this photon echo spectroscopy, we examine if there is still strong coupling if the broadening is introduced. And this dotted line is when everything is broadened, but you do see this uh, splitting anyway, right? So if you don't, increase the density and you should be able to see that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, 
so these are the sequence of pulses that we observed, so 200. Okay? So these are sequence of pulses we observed. So the first guy, take a look at this one. So this is the snapshot, not the snapshot, this is the zoom in of a photon echo as a function of time for molecules lying right on top of slits. This is the molecules with a spacer in between, and the thickness of spacer increases from B to C to D, where D corresponds to about 50 nanometers away from slits. Okay, so you're moving it up. So you clearly see two, ta two sort of pulses on site. So if you perform this uh, Husimi representation, take a look at this time frequency resolution, what you're going to see are two frequencies. And that will be a big surprise if you learn that these frequencies are nothing but your hybrid modes. So this is upper and lower polar return modes that result in this type of beatings that you see in the photon echo uh, signal. Okay, so that was the major sort of a conclusion from this uh, type of research. So finally, um, we also did high harmonic generation on um, TMDC materials, WS2. This is a very quick um, uh, discussion. So if you place a 2D material nearby uh, metal structure, WS2 has a really neat uh, um, optical resonance about two something electron volts, which you can couple um, to plasmons and you have a strong coupling. So this type of hybrid states and then uh, conveniently, this WS2 also has a huge chi-3, just gigantic chi-3 in plane, which means that you're going to have a third uh, harmonic generation. So now our goal was to simulate the third harmonic generation and to uncover what the properties of this would be if you place metal nearby. So very quickly, the, the third harmonic generation signal versus pump intensity, different colors indicate different pump frequencies. So the blue one corresponds to uh, pumping system at the upper polariton frequency. So I'm pumping it at one of the hybrid modes, and it looks like it actually better to pump it at this frequency rather than at the lower polariton mode. And it um, actually increases by a, fa by a factor of 100, something like that. And the very reason why this is the case is because the local field for the blue mode is localized where the uh, uh, 2D material is and basically enhances it. And the other one is not enhancing it that much. That's very uh, simple uh, statement. So if you look at the local field enhancement, you see this blue color is the local field where the 2D um, uh, material is. All right, enough with this nonsense. 3D we also did. So now let, let me show you the, uh, 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 the interesting part. So this is what uh, uh, my graduate student, uh, Lena Drobnik, is doing currently. So we're looking at the geometry of a periodic array of slits. And now we're turning on the hydrodynamic model. So now our metal is actually behaving nonlinearly as well. So we see the harmonic um, spectra. This is the uh, relay scattering, the second harmonic, and the third one. And the local field, well, at least according to our simulations, according to Jerry's, it's slightly different, so we need to converge on that. I like that one because it's very symmetric. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so the local field is concentrated inside the slits. So now the question is, what happens if I place uh, uh, molecules nearby? How their generation of harmonics is interacting with these guys? So what I did was to place uh, WS2 nearby and look how its third harmonic is affected by this guy. So I don't have here, I, there is no 2D material, only metal. So three, uh, two harmonics, number second, number third. Now I turn on the uh, WS2 and I'm pumping at the, pump, uh, the SPP mode. So you have the second harmonic still there. The third one is inhanely, in, insanely increased, right? As it should be because you have additional guy with Chi-3 sitting in there. But the really cool part is that you have a fourth one popping up. I'm not really sure how to explain this. This is really cool. So the fourth harmonic from obviously coming only from metal is somewhat um, uh, appearing in the spectrum if you place the 2D material with a strong chi-3. So there is some thinking to be done. So if you are, this is the last click, if you are to change the pump frequency and you detune your pump frequency from SPP mode, the second harmonic really disappears. So it's not strong enough local field to in create the second harmonic from metal, but your W is two is still there and generates the third one only, okay? So, and I'm done, and thank you so much for not falling asleep. Are there any questions?
better be. yeah.